Hello book lovers and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins and today I'm talking to author Stephen M. Davis. Stephen is the author of a time travel series of novels about Rebecca, a far from average 21st century girl who experiences time travel both in the past and in the future. Why and how is Rebecca travelling through time? Let's find out, shall we? Hi Stephen, first of all welcome and thank you for coming on Book Talk Radio Club. Hello Claire. Lovely to be here. Lovely to talk to you as well. Thank you. I've read Rebecca on the Spiral Staircase and Rebecca Away Back and absolutely loved them. Would you like to give Book Talk... Oh, my pleasure. Would you like to give Book Talk Radio Club's listeners a brief overview of the books, please? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite difficult without giving too much away. Sure. Um, which really you don't want to, but unbeknown to Rebecca, and as you said earlier, she's far from your average modern-day girl. In fact, she... Rather than have her head stuck in a mobile phone, she prefers to leave it indoors and instead sit in the woods, catching imaginary worlds. During one of these journeys or adventures down to the woods, and with Rebecca they are adventures, um, she finds an old key which, in time, after a lot of searching, unlocks a a ramshackle, derelict summer house down by a lake. Uh, Inside that summer house there's a... An old, almost ancient, dust-laden spiral staircase. Rebecca, being fearless and intrepid as she is, thinks, let's go and see what's upstairs and investigate. Opening the first door, uh, as she enters a pitch-black room, the door pulls from her hand. Frozen to the spot with her eyes shut, suddenly the room fills with sunlight and she hears a voice calling her. The thing is, this voice is from the past. It's a lady called Meredith from 1853, a troubled individual who greets Rebecca seconds later, both as her daughter and a confidant. Unbeknown to Rebecca, this is the first of many journeys that are going to take her into the past and towards the end into the future. She gradually begins to understand that she's a, she has a destiny, a mission, And it's to stop time taking an alternative direction, thereby subsequently affecting not only those that she meets in the past, but in the present day, her family and friends who are closest to her. And towards the end, she begins to get a grip and a handle on her capabilities and, as I used the word earlier, her destiny. And that then leads on to Rebecca a way back and my current work in progress which is volume three in the series which is um, Rebecca Beyond All Reason and I use that term had you you've obviously read the first two books Mm. I kind of like to take the reader to a world that's perhaps would question or challenge even the most vivid imaginations and hopefully leave you not really sure what exactly is going on. I know I never am, and I know Rebecca <laughs> certainly isn't. Stephen, um, I have to ask, of course, why time travel? Why write um, about time travel? I, I, it's funny, I, I, I've thought about that a number of times, and there isn't really a definitive answer other than Rebecca's voice is so loud and clear in my head, I'd recognise her in a crowded room. And, you know, to some people, that may sound a bit obscure or unusual. I'm guessing to a lot of authors, though, they, their characters resonate so much to them. They become beloved. Mm. And, um, quite often when I sit down to start typing, I'm thinking, well, where are we going to go here? Rebecca always has the answer. <laughs> and it was Rebecca's choice it was going to be time travel and that, that's a very loose term because it's not time travel like Doctor Who Back to the Future mm. um, the time machine there's a meaning to her journeys and as I said earlier it, it's about uh, making sure that time doesn't take an alternative direction and then subsequently affect future events in her own life um, hopefully I'm not giving too much away <laughs> I no you're um, fine you're so it was really down to Rebecca and it, you know whenever 
she leaves the old manor house that she lives in. Um, I say, okay, Rebecca, come on, we're going to go right here. And she's like, no, we're not. We're going left. And no matter how much of a plan I have in my head, it very quickly changes. And the more I've written about Rebecca, I should say written, written with Rebecca, the more I've learned to listen to her voice and accept that more often than not, I think, as is the case with most women, she's right. Um, and so I now follow her. I, I'm a messenger, almost, and that's how I feel. And, it, you know, again, this might sound a bit bleak or a bit obscure, but to me, generally, I, I genuinely feel like I'm conveying her story. So can I ask you, what, what makes Rebecca your far-from-average 21st century girl? Well, you know how it is. Um, lots of youngsters, you see them, they walk straight across the road in front of you, their face stuck in a mobile phone, yep. interested in the internet and uh, people they correspond with in the, in, on the internet. And, and just that world of... of missing out on Mother Nature and all that she has to offer, Rebecca embraces the things that a certain age bracket, my age bracket, grew up appreciating, mm -hmm. you know, watching spring bloom, um, seeing the sunset and sunrise and, and appreciating the rainy days as well as the sunny days. Mm. And I think a lot of young people nowadays uh, tend to, they lose that innocence a lot quicker, quicker than than perhaps my generation did. And Absolutely. I've, you know, my granddad once said to me, um, one of the hardest things in the world is for a young man to become a man. He said, but if you want to stay, if you want to be happy, you've then got to find your way back to being a boy. I just skipped the man bit. <laughs> 62 going on, 15 <laughs> if you like. Um, that actually, sorry, that, I have to interrupt because I, I want to ask, ask the next sorry. question. So that, that brings me to the next question. How on earth can a middle-aged guy, sorry, but you are, well, so am I, but not a guy, <laughs> get into the head of a 15-year-old girl? I know from reading your blog that you asked the question, could the spirit of Rebecca be telling her story through me? What's all that about? I mean, I know you had a near-death experience and you feel that Rebecca it's, came to you through that. that. Yeah, that's, that's quite an, an, an interesting thing, actually, because um, several months ago, maybe as, as much as a year ago, an individual, a friend of mine, um, had mentioned my stories and the fact that I tell it from the perspective of a 15-year-old girl. And this guy, unbeknown to me, never met before, um, asked the question. He was a spiritualist, by all accounts, and he said, as... Steve ever had a near-death experience, which I have. He said if he has, he's subsequently, he thinks, brought Rebecca's spirit back with me and then and subsequently telling her story. I, it's, it's odd because he kind of answered an awful lot of unasked questions, if you like, how I was managing to, to be so tactile mm. about the perspective and views of a 15-year-old girl. I subsequently went to see uh, a spiritualist, and I, I'm not particularly into this, um, but I have a very open mind. Um, and as soon as I walked in the front door, and I went with a mindset of yes, no to everything, I'm not going to give any clothes. This woman that I went to see immediately started waving her arms about, saying, I've got writing, I've got painting. Um, and after about... Um, 10 or 15 minutes she said oh this is really odd um, I've got a, somebody with me who's an old member of the royal family from the 11th century a Queen Matilda Scottish Queen who was um, what I tend to do is take historical facts and, and fictionalise them for my own purposes and she was very quickly beheaded by King Stephen who was William the Conqueror's great grandson because she could see beyond reason evidently, or words to that effect. And depending on whether you're reading Wikipedia or whatever, they've got different views, but she was, by some, perceived as a witch. Um, now, this woman said, this Queen Matilda is with me in the room, and she's your muse. Now, this is where it gets weird. The day before, I'd written a chapter about Queen Matilda, 
and the only person who knew about that was myself. How was? Uh, yeah, and <laughs> I'm still a year later, or several months later, coming to terms with that and, and coming, to, learning to understand it, accept it for what it is. Whatever it is, it seems to be working because mm. Rebecca is loved by everybody. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's easy for me to say, no, I love her, of course I do, <coughs> my own character. Mm. But, um, you know, very quickly after publishing, having hidden her away for several years, fearful of what people might think, um, the five-star reviews continued and have continued to flood in and... And still to this day, you know, I'm, I'm in that top quarter of a percent on Amazon. Fantastic. Of the 11 million books, and I seem to be maintaining that threshold. And it's just endless five-star reviews. And, and people who've not necessarily bought the book through Amazon, they've bought it through book shows and such like, you know, verbalise their opinion of how much they've embraced and love Rebecca but, and love the journey. But let's 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 I'm going to stop you there. Let, let, let's talk about Rebecca and the Spiral Staircase. This is book one in the series. Yeah. When Rebecca's parents move to a Gothic mansion in the north of England, she sets off exploring the 26 acres. On one of these jaunts, she finds a Victorian key that opens the door to a ramshackle summer house. Inside, she finds an old spiral staircase, which is the start of her adventures through time. Stephen, without giving too much away, what's her first adventure? Her first adventure, um, she meets a, 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 an, an amazingly graceful, troubled lady from 1853 who goes by the name of Meredith. Um, and within seconds of Rebecca going through the door, this woman greets her as if she's her daughter. Um, she pays no attention to the clothes from the, you know... The, our day that Rebecca's wearing um, it just embraces her as her daughter uh, it's Rebecca's trying to deal with not only the fact that she's suddenly gone back 160 years in time but and being in the presence of such a gracious and graceful individual um, and understanding her plight this woman's plight but she's got to deal with the fact that the woman's treating her as her daughter <laughs> and Scrambled eggs um, is a term that Rebecca often thinks about. Um, you know, her emotions are climbing on top of each other, almost like I think one term I refer to them on one of those um, merry-go-rounds. Mm, uh, the carousel. You know. Yeah, exactly, and, and understandably so. And I think for me as an author, it's been important that I get that perspective across of how she feels. Yes, she's flawed. Yes, she makes mistakes, but she learns. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, the thing is, I think with Rebecca, you, as a, when I read it, I felt so in tune with her and so understood exactly not what she was going, but her adventures, but what she was going through, her emotions. I felt all of her emotions. Your writing is wonderful. It really Thank is. Thank you. That's that's so important to me. I mean, I'm I'm still taking baby steps with this, and I'm still learning to believe that actually, you know, I, I think right at the get-go and all the way through, I've wanted to share my inner thoughts of Rebecca and how she responds to situations and try and help the reader to see... Somebody in America said, um, you can feel her breath and hear her thoughts. Mm. That's what I wanted. And for me to be able to do that, it's, it's such an emotional journey. I bet. I, I think the thing is, is there's so many hidden messages between the lines mm. about the way people behave, how parents interact, and the subsequent effect it has on their children. Very and nice. I think these messages between the lines, everybody seemingly has, has pinpointed, if not all of them, some of them mm. are important to them. And... Yeah. You know, my life has been a lot of twisting and turning um, from a very young age, growing up in uh, austerity-stricken World War II recovering East End of London. Um, I learned to appreciate the real things in life, 
Mother Nature and, you know, a glass of squash on a Sunday. Um, and I, I want everybody to understand or hopefully appreciate that there's so much more to life. And one of the most important things is the love that you have for others and that they have for you and the wonderful world that we live in. And hopefully Rebecca gets that across and that's the journey I wanted to go on for myself. The yeah, fact that yeah. everybody else is seemingly or are seemingly going on the same journey is 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 I, I can't even begin to tell you. I get emotional every mm-hmm. review I read. It, it genuinely brings tears to my eyes. Let, I read let, loud to my wife. Let, let, Stephen, let's go on to your second book now, A Way yeah. Back, Rebecca, A Way Back. This is the second book in the series. Rebecca is a little older now, and after her first year at university, yeah. common sense rears its head a little too often for her liking. She finds herself applying rational thinking to all that life offers. Why is that perceived as negative? It, it's not, but it's from Rebecca's perspective, she wants to stay in touch um, with the world she lives in. And what university uh, uh, kind of in some way made her try to apply rational thinking to her time travel adventures and her time in the past and people she'd met. And because all the way through the first book, she's never really sure that it's actually happening or maybe she's... Somewhere in her subconscious, she's maybe drawing on inherited memory. She doesn't want to apply this rational thinking to her journeys because she thinks that may well bring them to an end. And yet, we all need rational common sense sometimes. Um, But when Rebecca leaves that front door and heads down towards the summer house, the last thing on her agenda is common sense. Mm. Because if she did, she wouldn't have crossed across that rickety, rotting away veranda, opened the door at the end of the corridor next to the stairs and climbed the dust-laden old spiral staircase and then opened the door, which, unbeknown to her at the time, was a a journey into the history of the old 400-year-old manor house. It's, you know, rational thinking that stop you from even stepping on the veranda. And so that's why, it, from Rebecca's perspective, it, it's, it's not a negative, it's a thing she doesn't want to use. She no. wants to go with the, her, the open soul and spirit that she had as a 15-year-old. In book two, A Way Back, Rebecca does go quite a way back, in fact, to the 12th century. How yep. much research did you have to do in order to be able to paint the picture at this time with your words? Uh, well, this takes us back to the, the spiritualist guy. And this is Queen Matilda in the 12th century. And um, I randomly, maybe I didn't, maybe with Rebecca, we randomly come up with this meeting Queen Matilda. Um, I just clipped on 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century kings and queens. Mm. Um, and Matilda jumped out at me. Um, and there's not a lot of people would have heard of Matilda because she wasn't around for very long. And it's bizarre. It, it, she just fitted the journey that Rebecca wanted to go on. Right. Because, you know, she, she helped her escape the tyranny um, without giving too much away. Sure. You know, so... Um, yeah, I had to do a lot of research, and because she was only queen for a, a, it varies. Some will say six days, some say as long as six weeks, and I cross-referenced an awful lot of um, research on the on the internet, yeah. um, and, and and drew a, a rational conclusion to the person that she was, what she was about where she was going, and most, most importantly, where she needed to go. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, I even researched the language that different people would use. I mean, now, Queen Matilda, by example, would have been speaking with a mixture of Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Norman. 
<laughs> um, all mixed in together. Right. And, you know, if you read the book, you know the first couple of sentences are around that. Mm. Uh, um, but for the, for the reader's perspective, we go back to commonly used English that we do today. Um, it, it just makes it easier to read. But I always make sure that when I do that, I have a reason for doing that. I, I either arm um, Rebecca or Matilda in this particular incident with a reason for speaking in Rebecca's tongue. Right. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't leave a stone unturned in the garden. It, it's got to be believable. Absolutely. Well, that's what, yeah. that, that's what makes the books good. You, you kindly sent me the paperback of Rebecca's book. This illustrated novel is a light-hearted look at Rebecca's world and the way she sees the wonders of our beautiful planet. The illustrations themselves are very beautiful, and you, in fact, drew them, didn't you? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're a talented man, a writer and an artist. When did you start drawing? Uh, probably in all seriousness. Um, I was in a fire when I was 16, and uh, although I used to sketch a bit uh, prior to the fire that I was in... Um, for some reason, I just started painting endlessly and have painted ever since. I actually went to John Castle Royal School of Art to mm. um, do graphic communication. Um, I guess, uh, uh, and I hope it's not too churlish to say so, that I, I feel like I write with a paintbrush and that's what I, my intention is, to be very smooth and, and colourful in the way yeah. I write. And, mm. And other people have, have picked up on that. Absolutely. This, this third book really is just... It's aimed really at parents and young children to get them off the internet and out exploring, <laughs> you know, away from their Barbies, away from their Lego or right. Scout tricks, and out exploring Mother Nature. Yeah. Um, it's a real step away from the story, and I needed a break. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, literally, each illustration I did... I then it's like 31 individual stories mm. um, and I did the illustration and then wrote Rebecca's story about these individuals that she meet, you know, fairies, the elves, the pixies and where they might live and, you know, how they behave and why we never see them and, and you know, one of the messages in there that so someone I know picked up on um, his seven year old daughter said to him um, Dad, we need to go over Hatfield Forest exploring, and you can't take the mobile phone with you because if you do, <laughs> the fairies will all hide because the game will be up because you can take a photograph. Um, and he, he then said to me, "Thanks, I had to take her over <laughs> the forest without my mobile phone." I love it. Um, he said, and she's looking under, you know, the hedgerows and around the pond and, and such like, and that's what I wanted. That is what I wanted. I wanted Rebecca to broaden her horizons and broaden other people's horizons. And You know, it, it might sound anecdotal to say this, but I know what I want to achieve or what I wanted to achieve and still do. So who is, who is your target audience? I mean, did you have a type of reader in mind when you sat down to write the series? I mean, you're talking about a young girl here, but do you have, did you have an ideal reader? No, I didn't. And this has been very difficult to categorise. The oldest person I know who's read and loved Rebecca is a gentleman um, named Ivan, and he's 91. Right. And he said it took him right back to how he saw the world when he was young. Okay. Um, the youngest I know of is 15. The best quote was from my niece, and she said, having taken my book on holiday with her, she came back and said, Uncle Steve, it's a real book. <laughs> um, and anybody who's an author and has family around them and their perspective, especially in my case, you know, 60-year-old guy writing about 15-year-old girl, a lot of people say, oh, you've written a book, Steve. What's it about, fishing? <laughs> um, which is understandable. So when sure. they read it, it mm. comes as quite a shock to them. And that's great. No, I didn't have a target audience. I still don't. Right. I just want Rebecca out there. Yeah. Um, you know, she's. I liken her to. Uh, 
I created, I brought her in, into this world. I helped her through junior and senior school. I took the stabilizers off her bike when she was ready. <laughs> She's now left and gone exploring around the world and embracing everybody and everything she meets. Right. Um, and it's wonderful to sit back and see this suddenly gaining momentum. I did this morning an interview with... Um, Stephen, oh, no, sorry, I I don't, don't mean to be, Stephen, I'm, I'm going to have to hurry up a bit now because time's running on. Just tell me, you're, you're receiving some wonderful reviews for your books over on Amazon, including a fascinating and unique storyline and a magical book with a wonderful story from a very talented storyteller. I mean, there, there's loads more reviews than that. What was the best moment for you, the first review or the first sale, and why? The first review... Um, and it came by way of Twitter from a woman in Idaho, and she said, thanks, Rebecca wouldn't let me sleep. <laughs> I read the book in 27 hours. She said, every time I went to sleep, I thought, one more chapter, <laughs> and in the end, I stayed up and read the whole book. Okay. Now I want book two. And that was pretty much my first review. Right. And it's from a complete stranger. Fantastic. And I suddenly thought, okay, Maybe I might have something <laughs> <laughs> You most definitely have. If you found a magical spiral staircase and travelled into the future, what would you like to see for your Rebecca books? Oh, crumbs. Um, uh, right, OK. So, so, jokingly, there's a group of people who've read the book in America who... Um, try to get this petition together for Disney to create a film and a Rebecca Land where you go up the spiral staircase and it takes you back into different eras. Wonderful concept. I'd go there. <laughs> I'd go there, definitely. Yeah, I think, I think realistically, um, crumbs, just to be accepted and recognised as someone who writes well. I think really that's all I want. You already are, Stephen. Sorry? You already are. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, in myself, accepted within myself, to believe within me that actually I'm not just this guy who's, who's written a couple of books. I'm this guy who's written a couple of special books um, I can't get emotional and I'm sorry um, <laughs> That's all right. it's, it's so important to me for both me to accept and uh, pe those people around me and around the world to say yeah do you know what Steve this is pretty good um, I don't know at what point I'll finally I mean, the lovely words that you've written um uh, and another member of your your, your club, Tricia, uh, and I, I could read them ten times and they'd still have the same effect on me. They'd still make me feel emotional and gracious. And I think, what more do I want to achieve? Do you know, I'd like to help my son out who lives in Canada um, and has got a girlfriend, um, which is, you know, we're talking... Financially, if possible, mm. not for me. Those around me, that those people who supported me, yeah. that have had to live with me, tweeting about Rebecca, <laughs> Facebooking about Rebecca, <laughs> all the time, talking endlessly about Rebecca. What? I've got a fishing friend for the last 15 years who's heard every twist and turn when we're fishing together, bless him. Um, and for those people, I'd like to go... There you go. Thank you very much for all your support. Mm. Uh, you know, she's there. Rebecca? Rebecca, yeah, she'd love to be a movie star. And so many people have said it would make a great film. Oh, definitely. Uh, to watch the title scroll up at the end. <laughs> film taken from a book written by Stephen M. Davis. I'm not sure how I deal with that. Or what? How many boxes of tissues I'd go through? But yeah, that's that's the ultimate dream, and it is a dream at the moment. But she's definitely got momentum. She has. Thank you. Lastly, where can Book Talk Radio Club listeners purchase your books? 
Okay, so if you live in and around the Essex area, there's um, uh, a bookshop in uh, Colchester called Red Lion Books, been there about 50 years, who've just started stocking copies of my book. Uh, alternatively, through Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk, um, or wherever you are in the world, but Amazon.com seems to be the one that covers it all. Okay. Um, and if you just type in the search, Stephen with a P-H-M, Davis, D-A-V-I-S, um, Rebecca will come up towards the top somewhere. Um, so, And I always say, um, if you've got a Kindle, for the price of a cup of coffee, you could have Rebecca in your life. The coffee will last you 10 minutes. Rebecca will be with you forever. That's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Stephen. Please come back on Book Talk Radio Club again. I'd love to chat with you and hear more. In the meantime, good luck for the future, and thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio Club. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you.